Guinness, Leprechaun, Shamrocks, Harps, and Celtic Knots. These are just a few of the many symbols that have come to represent the Emerald Isle, but perhaps also parts of the southern state of Georgia, too. The director of the Center for Irish Research and Teaching at Georgia Southern University, Dr. Howard Keeley, argued in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that many of the earliest arriving settlers to Georgia during the 18th century were from Ireland and came in search of, quote, religious freedom and access to land ownership, end quote. In fact, the American Community Survey of 2016 indicated that approximately 800,000 Georgians have Irish ancestry, the vast majority of whom are concentrated in northern and eastern or coastal Georgia. For this reason, we are pleased today to welcome one of the world's experts on the Irish language, Dr. Seamus Dillon. Dr. Dillon is currently the head of the Department of Arts at the Waterford Institute of Technology, where he also served for many years as the first Irish language lecturer. He is originally from County Limerick and earned his PhD in Irish language studies at Mary Immaculate College. Dr. Dillon stated in earlier scholarship that, quote, the Irish language has an interesting and multifaceted past. The present and future for very different reasons will be as interesting and multifaceted. Positivity is the word of the day, end quote. And so with only positivity to offer, let's welcome our esteemed guest whose talk today addresses the history of the Irish language in the United States. Dr. Dillon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Troy, for that really, really interesting and really um, um, a nice introduction. So thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do now is going to share my screen with you, um, if I can. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, my research which will, I suppose, touch upon as well, as Troy mentioned, um, the US, and hopefully as well, uh, well, it will include a bit about the, both the state of Georgia. So my presentation is titled Migration, Revival, Inspiration, Irish Language in the USA Pre-1900. Uh, and this, I suppose, um, refers also to my PhD research and also to ongoing research on the history of the language um, in the US, particularly in the late 19th century, which um, we refer to as the revival period. Um, so at the moment, um, I suppose we're all talking about President Biden and he, we, in Ireland, we're proud to hear about his links to our country. And I think what, when he speaks, he often speaks about the history of the Irish um, leaving Ireland for America, but also about the, the, the deep, rich um, Irish literature. And this uh, is what he would have said, or this is what he did say when he spoke um, in Dublin a number of years ago. He said about his own family, they left Ireland for Liverpool, where they boarded the Excelsior to sail to America. As we Biden, so he was referring to his family, walked around Garden Street, my family and I literally wondered what it must have been like to leave everything behind. We imagined attending an American wake the last time you, your the last time you'd see your family, your friends, the soil that you love. So an American wake, if you like, was like a, a party for those who were leaving. And it was called a wake because you would never see those members of your family again. Everything between us runs deep, literature, poetry, sadness and joy, but most of all, resilience. Despite everything, we've never stopped being dreamers. I think we Irish are the only people in the world who are actually nostalgic about the future. So again, I'd just like to mention that because we, we, we mention in Ireland a lot about her special relationship with the US. And that relationship is based on, was founded on, and depends on people and the history of people. And um, all those things include literature, poetry, sadness and joy, emotions that President Biden um, refers to there. Um, so with that in mind, he mentioned literature um, and we're talking uh, this afternoon about the, the Irish language. And one of my favorite um, Irish... ...Wales Trust, which are areas where the Irish language is still the living language, the daily language um, of, of the people. And she talks here about when she goes to the Gwaeltacht, that not just the language speaks, but the area itself speaks to her. 
the countryside, the nature. So I'll just read it for you. Iktaman cheer, so driving west. Lauren gach kuine den lehne shulum, in a tianga fenig, tianga a higum, ni lub de quil, na cor de voher, na quilig surilum, a cogrenil, a six siskernig. So she's talking, about, talking again about driving west and every corner of the peninsula, the first line there, every corner of, that, of the peninsula speaks to me in its own language. Tianga, um, the Irish for language, it speaks to me in its own language. There isn't a part of the countryside, a part of, of the woods, of the roads that don't speak to me in their own language. So that idea, again, I suppose that the connection between people, language and where they live. Um, and then I suppose another poet that I really like is Sean O'Reardon. And the reason I'm mentioning Sean O'Reardon is he writes about, or he wrote about, um, he has passed on now, but the whole idea of uh, Ireland, I suppose, having two languages, Irish and English. And Irish was not his first language, and he would have loved if it was. And he writes in Irish, and he wrote in Irish, and he often writes about how he would have loved to have been able to write, I suppose, better, in, as, as he would have seen it, um, in Irish whereas he was actually an excellent Irish language poet. But I suppose it's that, that um, debate, that conversation, that discussion, all of that about Irish and English and when you live between two languages and which is yours and which isn't yours and which most, which represents you most. And he says, he's titled the poem being called, this language is half with me. And again, I suppose, um, it wasn't half with him because he was an excellent Irish poet, but the fact that he wasn't from one of these Gwertrach areas or that he wasn't brought up in the Irish language, he felt that it wasn't um, as much a part of him as the English language was. So, Tatanga Ella in Akilat, a stair shilling bilum, the ronig doing of Adriv, is a style to shin or is a style to shing or hin. Ni more doing do Nakilat, go slick fishing on it, no good for owing the Yarman, is good for Uitcha shing. And you can see the translation there on the on the right hand side. And he talked about getting close to a language and he, to be fully absorbed in it um, is how he wants to be. He wants to be, I suppose, swallowed up by the Irish language, to be completely covered in the language. Um, but despite all of that, as you can see, the first line there that's translated, there's another tongue beside you. And she says to me, be mine. So I suppose that constant struggle in Ireland between Irish and English. And just by we're talking about Sean O'Riordan, um, this poem probably isn't particularly relevant to what I want to talk about this evening, um, but it's one of my favourite poems. And again, I just want to show it to you because it, it, it's one of, I think, um, the finest poems that shows how the Irish language um, provokes emotion, uh, feeling. Um, it's not just words or describing something but it kind of it can explain how a person feels. It can create those feelings in us. And he talks about Eilika Mavahir, um, so the burial of his mother, the, the day his mother was buried. And I'll just read um, on the left-hand side, verse one and verse three, and you can look at the translation there on the screen. Green on vehev in Ulhurt is sishernach ishida on tranona, bach valaha ik parturacht, mor skrad strache irinon brat. The Queenies are in love again on screaming. Love of the in Ahantham or Aig. Love a hall reeve canastacht shanavibla. Love of the Marvalsam is too time. So it's, it's that particular verse there, number verse three, that I really like. Um, because in the Irish language, he talks there about a love of the in Ahantham. So a distinctive hand. So as he's describing for us, you know, how he felt. Uh, when his mother died and he talks there about the hand that wrote the letter so in between verse one and verse two he has found a letter from his mother and he looks at the writing of the letter and he says it's not the writing that he remembers it's the hand you know the hand that had a biblical charitableness a, a hand healing the sick child so and what's really really nice i think is the hand as distinctive as any face so it kind of i think in my own experience anyway you know it creates that image you know of the hand that cares for the child, that cares for the, the, the cares for the person whom you love, and you 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 remember maybe the hand like it was a face, you know. You, if any of us here are listening to this, and you're maybe a mother or a father or or someone who cared for us, um, you kind of remember their hands. You know, you can see how they how they touched you, how they held your hand, maybe how they rubbed your face, and so on. So I think that's quite um, 
uh, emotive. It's, it's a really nice uh, poem. And it's, um, as you can see, that the bottom of the screen, it's been translated by Paul Muldoon, and it comes from um, a collection of Sean Rear Dog poetry. Um, and then another poet that I really like, I suppose it would be my favorite poet, uh, comes from my hometown, Michael Hartnett. Um, and he decided in 1975, a bit like Sean O'Riordan, Michael Hartnett was not brought up through the medium of Irish, although he loved the language. And he decides in 1975 that he's not going to write any more poetry in English. He's going to write from then on in Irish and in nothing else. Now, he did change shortly after that, maybe a few years after that. But I think it's just, again, it, it shows in this writing, in these poems, in these words, that kind of, I suppose, the emotional, the, the psychological turmoil. And I say turmoil, I, I, I don't use that word lightly, but it, that's what it was. These people really wanted to be, even though they knew the Irish language, they wanted to be covered in it. They wanted to be uh, like put a, put a blanket of the language around them. Um, and when he, Michael Hartman tells us here in the first verse of this poem, when he decided to do that, at first, all he could think of were English words. He wanted to write in Irish, but it were the English words. It was the English words that came to him. He says, I sunk my hands into tradition, sifting the centuries for words. This quiet excitement was not new. So the excitement of trying to get these Irish words to write with, he loved the language. But emotion challenged me to make it sable. And then after all that excitement and trying to get the words out to write an Irish language poem, Pegasus pulled up, the girth broke, and I was flung back on the gravel of Anglo-Saxon. And later on the poem, then he says, I have made my choice and leave with little weeping. I have come with meager voice to court the language of my people. And why I picked this and why I like this poem, um, maybe as a start to tonight's presentation, again, it's the language of my people. And I, not even just about Irish lang language, but all languages. It's not just words um, or writing. It's a language of a people. It's a language of a group of people. It creates the identity of a people. Um, it creates a community. So um, that's maybe a, a long-winded introduction. But I want to talk about um, maybe how the Irish language got from um, Ireland to, to, to America, to the United States. And we're here in the Waterford Institute of Technology, and we're looking here at the Middle Georgia State um, University or the in, um, in Georgia, uh, which is up here on the screen. And the, the distance, the wide open sea that you can see uh, in front of you there. And the Irish people traveled that sea, crossed that sea for a better life, not just in the 19th century, but for centuries before that. Many of them didn't make the journey. Ships were wrecked, people died. People died on the ships um, from hunger, starvation, disease, um, before they even got to, to America. And I just think it's, it's, it's interesting to just to look at that, you know, look at the screen and that wide gulf, that wide gap um, that people were willing to travel. Many of them, when they looked, if you look from the west coast of Ireland, you know, or all around Ireland, which was sea for miles and miles and miles. And to think that they were going to leave, like again, in the 19th century, there was no, no Facebook, there was no telephones, there was no anything. To leave Ireland and travel that distance, it was like dying, okay? Especially for your relatives. You were not going to return, um, but you were driven by the chance of a better life. Um, just to show you there, so you're probably familiar with some of these places, um, uh, Donegal there in the Northwest, uh, Mayo, Galway, Tipperary, Wexford, uh, Cork and Kerry, and this is Waterford here, and of course, the capital, uh, Dublin. Um, and when I mentioned earlier on about Gwaeltacht areas, these are the kind of the dark green areas here, where language, where the Irish language is still the living language, where people speak Irish on a daily basis. It is still spoken all over Ireland, but these are special designated areas by the Irish government as Gwaeltacht areas where the Irish language has, um, has special status. Last census, census 2016, we, we have an Irish language question in the census. And this is refers to, um, to, to that very thing, the Irish language. And there, there are over 110,000 weekly speakers of the language. And 5% of those are 5.6 live in Gwaeltacht areas. We have um, over half a million daily speakers, but that's within education. And I'll mention that in a second uh, again. 
and 2.7 of those lived in Gwael areas, and we have 73 or 74,000 daily speakers, and almost 28 of those live in Gwael areas. Okay. Um, but what I think is more most interesting or more interesting is this slide here, which talks about the number of people who can speak Irish according to the 2016 census. And it says 40% of the population of Ireland can speak Irish. Now, I wish that were completely true. Um, it is true to an extent, but as you can see here, um, the, the number of those who spoke, or that percentage, if you like, who spoke Irish with the education system was almost 32%. So because Irish um, is a subject, the language is a subject which all students, all children in primary and secondary education have to learn, a lot of those numbers come from the education system. Whereas you can see here, um, outside the education system with the asterisks, those who spoke Irish daily outside the education system um, was maybe 4.25%. Um, but what that I suppose it that's another um, I suppose we need to look at that in, in more detail in that daily speakers and weekly speakers and, and so on um, doesn't correspond directly to the amount of people who actually speak the Irish language as most of those who live outside the Gwertoft areas will work uh, in an English medium environment so there's the numbers themselves don't tell the full story so while there probably aren't 40 percent speaking Irish on a daily basis they're probably 4.2 is still um, probably too low. Uh, it's probably somewhere in between. And I, the Irish constitution, I mentioned the government there and the Gwaith of the areas, the Irish language is the, is the national language of Ireland. Okay, so if you're looking at our constitution of the, the first language of Ireland, it's the Irish language. And English, the English language is, is recognised as a second official language. And just to give you a brief timeline before we get to, to, to America, so it was a Celtic language and I suppose it maybe 2,500 years ago was when Irish first began to be spoken in Ireland, a reversion of it. Um, we don't know, we don't have written records, but that's maybe what the historians think. Um, we have a, a form of the Irish language called Oam in the fourth century, which really was a system of lines um, uh, on stone, okay? um, lines and marks on stone. So it wasn't really writing, but it was a, a system of, of writing, we could call it a system of writing. It wasn't until Christianity arrived in Ireland in the fifth century, and I'm sure you've heard of St. Patrick. So St. Patrick uh, brought Christianity to Ireland, and it was with that, with the monks, the monasteries, that writing began properly in Ireland, and the writing of the Irish language began at this stage, okay, in the fifth century. And that's what we refer to maybe as old Irish, the old Irish language, old Irish literature, where the monks began to write down all the stories that they heard um, from the from the, the Celts, they were, we call them the Celts at that stage, um, and stories like Fionnacool, Cúchollan, and all those ancient Irish legends that some of you would have heard about were written down at this particular time, which is interesting. They were written down in, in Christian times, but they, they deal with a time that is pre-Christian in the Celtic pagan Ireland, but they were only written down at that stage because it's the monks who brought um, writing to Ireland. The annals, I suppose, are the first contemporary piece of writing, contemporary at the time, because that's what the monks kept. They wrote down, the annals were like their diaries, they wrote down all that happened in Ireland. Um, again, just referring to poetry, um, in the, from the 12th to the 7th century, I like to call it, um, I suppose, the golden age of Irish literature. From that particular time, in that particular time, we actually had universities or schools, the Bard, Bard Scullina in Irish, the Bardic schools, where we had men uh, at the time who went to these schools for six or seven years to learn about poetry, to learn how to write poetry, to learn about the syllabic poetry, to learn about the meter, the rhyme, and the rules. And because they spent so much time in, in, in school learning to be poets, they became professional poets. They earned money. When they came out, they, be, they had patrons who paid them to write poetry. Um, and the poetry was really good, if it, even if it was, I suppose, um, it, it wasn't emotional as such that it, because it was had to be based on meter and syllables and rhyme, um, a lot of it was um, based on fake themes, a fake love, fake everything. It was more about the, um, the, the structure and the rhyme and the syllables than the themes of the poetry. Um, around that time, too, we have what we call Dawn Graw, or the love poetry. Dawn Graw, love, the love poem. So Graw there meaning love, 
and Dawn referring to poems, so Dawn Grow. And we think, or it's thought that a lot of those poetry, or a lot of that poetry, a lot of those themes, that style came from France, came from um, when the Normans came to Ireland, and they had a style of poetry called the Amour Courtois, or courtly love poetry. Um, prose wasn't re as strong as poetry at the time, but shortly after it, it did become str strong. So after that period, which I called the, 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 um, the golden age, uh, my terminology, what happened after that? Well, we talked about the Celts, I mentioned the Normans, we also the Vikings. We had lots of invaders to Ireland, but most of them, the Celts, the Vikings, the Normans, um, became, as we like to say, more Irish than the Irish themselves. It wasn't until maybe with the plantations and our relationship with our next door neighbour, uh, Great Britain, England, uh, the English, that, that I suppose that that relationship where previously the, the invaders had become Irish and the Irish themselves, um, it didn't happen with, with, with the English um, invaders. So we have plantations and what happened with the plantations was where um, Irish land, the land of Irish lords, those lords and earls who paid the poets, who gave them patronage, um, was taken off them and given to English landlords. So this ended the patronage because the, the, the lords didn't have money to pay the poets, so it ended the bardic schools and it was an end to that style of poetry. It wasn't the end of Irish language literature, but it was an end, I suppose, that, that golden era, as I call it. Because after that, we did have what we call Auron, which were song poems, kind of free verse, if you like. Um, they weren't as structured or as syllabic or as um, owing to rules or as dependent on rules as previously. With Ashling poems, Ashling is the word for a vision. So in these poems, um, the, the writers had a vision that Ireland was going to be saved by a knight in shining armour. Uh, and then we had courts na filiachta, which are courts of poetry, where the poets from the, the bardic schools and the, who had no patrons came together and wrote poetry amongst themselves um, without money, without food. A lot of them uh, became what we call wandering labourers. So they went, I suppose, from being um, at the top of, the, of society to being um, at the bottom, on the bottom rung of the ladder. And where that leave the language itself, the kind of everyday language, where in the 19th century, uh, following all of those things that I, that I mentioned there, uh, business, law, politics, education, religion, all done through the medium of Irish, sorry, through the medium of English. Um, so if you had a child growing up in 19th century Ireland, you know, he or she who had never, would never have heard of Irish before, you know, would never have heard of Irish because when they went to school, school was in English, religion was in English, and everything else was in English. And to add to all of that, then, um, the, the potato famine of the 1840s. And that was, you know, it, it's just a story there in itself, but that was detrimental to the Irish language as well, because what happened was that if you look into the previous bullet points there, um, where I mentioned that the, the poets were now at the bottom of the ladder, you know, the, the Irish language kind of became um, the language of the rich people in society to the language of the poor. Which, ha which meant that when the famine hit, which also hit the poorest, the poorest in society, it also meant that the famine hit the, the language, the Irish language speakers as well. So the people who died, the people who emigrated, um, obviously when they died, the language, uh, they took the language with them. When they emigrated, they took the language with them. So these were all detrimental blows, death blows to the Irish language. Okay, but I suppose in a good way, when I mentioned immigration there, those who emigrated, the poor people, took the language with them. And we'll come to that in a second. And then the period after that in the late 1870s, 1880s and 1890s became known as the, the language revival period in Ireland. So where does America come into this? Um, well, as early as the 1620s, ships were sailing regularly from southern Irish ports such as Cork and Kinsale, laden with provisions, textiles and Irish servants to exchange for West Indian sugar and tobacco. During the 1600s, Irish Catholics appeared in every mainland colony. Catholic immigration to the Caribbean continued into the 18th century. So um, a lot of work done there by Kirby Miller on um, immigration from Ireland. And you can see there people emigrating from Ireland um, as early as the 1620s. And just to mention a few of those, I suppose, pre-famine. So I mentioned the famine, but pre-1840s, who, who were the Irish speakers in America then? We know of an Anne Glover, we know from um, an account of one of the, the witch trials um, that she was hanged for being a witch. Uh, 
and the story goes uh, that she, um, when she, when her court case came up, or if you call it a court case, and her trial came up, uh, for some reason she only spoke in Irish. Uh, maybe it was some kind of um, an illness or a psychological illness, but for some reason she only spoke in Irish. And the people in the court, not knowing what she was speaking or how what language it was, um, thought that she was, I suppose, speaking or being partaking witchcraft. What's interesting is that one story has it that there actually was another Irish person in the court who translated for her um, to the court, uh, but a lot of that is, um, is, is, is not for certain. But I suppose I mentioned it because it's, we do a, a documented account of, of this woman called Anne Glover speaking Irish during those witch trials. Um, we also have accounts of Irish people speaking Irish uh, in George Washington's army. Uh, we have Catholic priests at the time uh, in America, speaking Irish. Uh, we have a Matthias Seamus O'Convee in the 18th century who worked in an Irish Spanish dictionary, I think, uh, in California, I think it was um, at the time. And we have letters from another emigrant, Padraig Fierish Condun, who emigrated from Con County Cork to, to America. And we know from his writing letters home that he spoke Irish in America and that he encouraged his family and encouraged friends to go to America because he told them they would be better off in America than they would have been than they were in Ireland at, at the time. And this is part of one of his letters. I'll read in Irish first and I'll translate it. Gwim tu scrif chuam go bacht in san tiangan huelge, or is onan lum lurg de var fin agus frutl de vin veil de clus agus de ark. So he says, Gwim tu. I beg you or I ask you, I implore you to write to me in the Irish language because I'd love to see you know, how you write the words. I'd love to see the Irish language again. Okay. And then post-famine um, is the period I want to speak to you about really, I suppose, if it, my research is, and mostly uh, it, we can break it into three groups, I suppose, people, societies, and publications, really the people. And that's why in the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the poetry and about how it was the language of the people. We don't have, very many written records of the Irish language at this particular time. We have records, I suppose, and written records, but not a lot, and not that would compare to other languages. And most of those come from um, maybe columns in newspapers or poems in newspapers and so on. Uh, and the societies then were societies, pr primarily we call them the Philo-Celtic or the Philo-Celtic societies, where people came together um, to teach the Irish language, to speak in the Irish language, and to socialize in the Irish language. And I just mentioned uh, three people there at the bottom of the screen. Michal Olochon um, in 1878 helped to found the Philo Celtic Society of Brooklyn, so the Irish Language Society of Brooklyn. And he emigrated from County Galway um, to, to the States, to New York. And he is uh, very important because he set up on Gael, or the Gael, an, an Irish language journal, or a bilingual journal, an Irish English journal, which is where we have some of those written, written records I mentioned. And it's really, really important because there probably wasn't anything similar in Ireland at the time. And it's really, really important to mention, to note, and, and interesting to say that this journal is like started in America, this Irish English journal. Um, we have Padraig Fertair, another person, he emigrated from County Kerry, and he would have been part of the Common Nave Brown Dawn or the St. Brendan's Society um, in, in, I think it was New York as well. And he became the Irish language editor of the Gaelic American newspaper, where he would have published poems and stories from his native Kerry and from other Irish language speakers um, in, in Boston and in New York. And another person who I would have done a lot of research on was Michal C. O'Shea or Michael O'Shea. And he would have been instrumental in setting up the Boston Father Celtic Society or the Boston Irish Language Society and also their newspaper, The Irish Echo. And I think. A lot of those people are interesting and really interesting. Uh, Michal Olochan probably has, um, you know, people, Irish language researchers and scholars would know about him. But other people, like I mentioned there, Anne Glover, I mentioned Seamus O'Convey, and here Project for Tear, Michal C. O'Shea. It's important to remember these people um, who were, in inverted commas, just members of Irish language societies, but who were instrumental in keeping the language alive in their communities um, through the, the societies that they founded and through the the newspapers um, with which they worked. And just to give you maybe an idea of what happened at some of these Philo-Celtic or Philo-Celtic societies or these Irish language societies, this is from the Boston Globe in 1873. And it's, it's I suppose it's particularly relevant because it refers to 
Michael C. or Shea, that person who I mentioned, uh, he, to his co co committee or his society. At a meeting of the Philocentric Society at Boston Hall last evening, Mr. PJ Flatley in the chair, the committee appointed at a previous meeting reported a constitution and bylaws which were adopted. The object of the society is to furnish instruction for those who desire it in the Irish language. It is proposed to give this instruction on two evenings uh, of each week and teachers will be engaged for that purpose. The society will hold its next meeting on Saturday evening. So I just want to mention that because again, it shows you, I suppose, the structure, you know, the, the status, they had the constitution, they had laws, they had teachers, and, and they were setting up classes. You know, it wasn't just, again, I use that word in inverted commas, just a group of people coming together um, to speak in Irish or to socialize, like I mentioned, but it was also under this particular structure. And that Irish language, or that Irish echo newspaper, which would have had some Irish language material. Now, admittedly, most was in English, but they had Irish language um, material. Just to mention, I suppose, a lot of these journals at the time, of these newspapers, if you look at maybe the third line there, I'll read it all, but I, uh, the third line is particularly interesting. The Irish echo starts into existence with the opening of this new year of our Lord, 1886, and its mission is to aid and assist in the vindication of the character of the Irish race from the foul slanders of centuries by English writers. The reason I mentioned that is because there's a school of thought, um, you know, that the Irish didn't consider themselves as immigrants or emigrants, but as exiles, that they felt that they were, they were kind of pushed out or evicted from their own country. And that's what we see in a lot of the Irish language literature, a lot of the Irish language newspapers I meant, or the Irish newspapers and Irish language columns, this idea that it wasn't immigration or migration or um, anything like that, that it wasn't, that they didn't go by choice, but that they were um, pushed. And uh, that, that's a theme that comes up a lot um, at this time. Okay, so I mentioned some of those there, um, the post-famine speakers, Michal O'Shea, Michal Lochon, and Partick Fertair. Um, and not only, again, Michael C. O'Shea, um, were they involved in speaking the language, teaching the language, setting up societies, but they also had this, um, I suppose, some of them had this idea that it was important to keep the literature alive, that, that it wasn't just speaking it or hearing it, but also the literature was important to have literature. And I won't go through these um, in detail, but lots of the Irish speakers in America at the time would, who would have written poetry um, had maybe two or three themes. The first theme there, there on the, on front, in front of you, Cade Slán and now Gahirn. It's those goodbyes to Ireland. This, again, that I suppose you, you from lots of immigrants and immigrant communities, um, goodbye, they're, they're not going to go home. Okay, so it's a sadness, it's a, a loneliness. It's a farewell. Uh, in his second one of his themes and on the poem there on the screen, Tianga, er, uh, again, that word Tianga, language. And it's a poem about language. It's a poem about the importance of language and the importance of language to the identity of the Irish uh, when they weren't at home. And maybe as a, it was a way of kind of bring them together. And then just to, to bring the piece on Michael O'Shea to a conclusion there, I just wanted to mention this and so to show you this, again, from one of the, the uh, newspapers at the time. I know it's a big quote there, but I wanted to mention it because, you know, he wasn't a professor. The, the body of Professor Michael C. O'Shea, you know, he was a gardener um, who wrote poetry and who spoke the Irish language. But I think the word professor there, I know we, we, use, we might use that word a lot today, but I think at the time it, it shows the status or the, I suppose, the respect, the recognition that the people gave to him that were afforded to him for his work on the Irish language. And you can see there in the middle piece there, the third or fourth line down, that at his funeral, you know, there, there were representatives from the Gaelic League, the Philoketic Society of Boston, Mission Church, St. James's Irish language classes, who came to pay their last tribute to the pioneer who was instrumental in forming the first organization for the revival of the Irish language in this country. So again, uh, what, I want, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, that these people, many of them, emigrated from poverty, from the famine, from, um, I suppose, from the fear of dying. And when they got to America, you know, they could have done lots of things. They could have, you know, well, they, they did do lots of things. But you would have imagined that maybe the, the language and keep the language alive uh, might have been, might have been on top of their list when they were struggling to survive, struggling to find work. Um, but you can see here that this is what this person is remembered for. And this is just an example.
So the, the esteem, the respect that they had, not just the Irish speakers, but the language itself in. Um, and when I speak about the, uh, I mentioned in the, in the title there, inspiration. I mentioned inspiration because I think when we had the revival period in Ireland, and we didn't have, we founded, or the, the Conor and the Gaelge, or the Gaelic League, the, the, the society, I suppose, for promoting the Irish language and for reviving the Irish language in Ireland, or one of them, wasn't founded until 1893. And you would have seen there, just as I mentioned, that there were lots of, the, of societies in America, um, maybe 10, 15 years before that. So my opinion is that, you know, the, 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 the Irish revival period, or the Irish revival in Ireland, got its, got its inspiration from these communities and from these societies in America. And the first president of Ireland, who was also the first president of the Gaelic League, uh, went to America in 1905 to raise money for the language movement at home. So in a way, what you have is that the Irish language speakers outside of Ireland, in the States, in America, funding or partly funding the Irish language uh, movement in Ireland, which I think is really, really interesting uh, and really, really important to, to note that. Um, because we often think, I suppose, as people who emigrate, particularly this time from the famine, as poor people um, who were maybe looking for, for uh, menial jobs in America, uh, but they actually, we need to recognize them for what they did and for their, I suppose, their input into the revival of the Irish language and not just the revival, but the keeping alive of it. And just maybe to come to some kind of a conclusion, just to mention, I suppose, uh, um, Georgia, uh, in this particular talk here, um, going through the newspapers, came across some references to the Irish language. Um, the Morning News newspaper uh, in 1894 mentions about Savannah Hibernians uh, helping to raise money for, um, if you can see, I'm not sure if you can, maybe if I can um, highlight it uh, some bit here, um, to, to help to fund uh, to help endow a chair of Irish language at the Catholic University of Washington, which happened that the ancient order of Hibernians or an Irish language society funded or helped to fund the creation of an Irish language lectureship in Washington, in the Catholic University. So, you know, you can see here maybe a pattern or maybe kind of um, where um, they went from being very, very poor to um, eventually in America, you know, having a lectureship in a university, which it, which wasn't a very small, it was a huge step. We also have here uh, from March 18, 1898, so the day after St. Patrick's Day, there's a piece here on the Celts of Augusta celebrate. Um, and maybe we shouldn't go too much into that to see what type of celebrations they had. But I, I know from, from current day, um, uh, looking at the newspapers and online that St. Patrick's Day is still a very big thing in, in Georgia as well today. Um, there's also here, I'm going to read this, I think that it's um, uh, a very in interesting, it's humorous, it comes from, the, again, the Morning News uh, in 1900, and I hope it doesn't reflect what I'm doing here this afternoon. It says, the Irish man in America, while he has acquired new, seldom loses many of the old qualities which distinguished him at home. An Irish man is nothing if not fluent and eloquent. I have seen and heard unlettered old men in the mountains of Donegal who could put to blush professed orators. But in the American climate, they grow from greater practice, I suppose, yet more eloquent. If you want an impromptu speech at any time on any subject under the sun, a speech that would deceive the listener into the idea that it is a really fine one and that the speaker knows what he is talking about, call upon an Irish man. Someone has said to me, adding, and the less he knows about the subject, the more eloquent he will be. So um, humorous. Hopefully not true uh, this afternoon. Um, and again, just an, another one here, uh, a, a bit more serious, I suppose. It talks about the um, um, an Irish member of Parliament who tried to use the the Irish language um, in the Parliament in London, but he was um, he, he was stopped from doing so. And you can see there at the bottom, um, there's a translation of the piece. Mr. Speaker, the Irishman said, representing an Irish constituency blind to a nation having its own language. Um, and still fighting for its freedom as a nation, I esteem it my duty to address this alien parliament in the language of my country. Again, just a few more um, pictures there and extracts from the 
from the Irish, from the newspapers in Georgia that mention the Irish language and refer to Ireland. Okay. Um, and finally, and sorry, maybe gone a bit over time. I want to come back again to, I, I started off with a president, but maybe to finish with a president as well. And uh, maybe one of your presidents who, with, for, of whom we're most proud of in Ireland, that's President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And I think that this summarizes, I suppose, what I'm talking about this evening. It summarizes the, the relationship between Ireland uh, and the United States. Um, he says, and so it is that our two nations divided by distance have been united by history. No people ever believed more deeply in the cause of Irish freedom than the people of the United States, and no country contributed more to building my own than your sons and daughters. They came to our shores in a mixture of hope and agony, and I would not underrate the difficulties of their course once they arrived in the, in the United States. They left behind hearts, fields, and a nation yearning to be free. It is no wonder that James Joyce described the Atlantic as a bowl of bitter tears, and an earlier poet wrote, they are going, 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 and we cannot bid them to stay. So thank you very much. I hope um, that was interesting and that people are still awake. Um, and thank you very much for, for your attention. Well, thank you very much too, Dr. Dillon. That was fascinating. I actually am wondering if I should throw my pre-written questions out the window now that I have so many more that have popped up. Uh, speaking for myself, I was particularly fascinated by all of the poetry that you initially introduced and then you know the the newspaper excerpts as well uh, but with that i'm i'm thinking i'm going to let dr kearney get us started with the questions if he would like to begin that sounds great i need to start my should i start my video there we go all right just a second all right, my first question is about poetry and, and you got me sort of started on it because uh, uh, your talk touched uh, brilliantly on, on this point, but maybe we can, can go into it a little more. Uh, so that my question is what kind of metrical awareness or scansion, this type of thing, apply to Irish poetry now or in the past? Does one ever look for rhyme or partial rhyme? for alliteration, or for something else. Yeah, I, I think it's it, interesting that you mentioned the word um, metrical awareness. At the time, when, like I said, in the golden era, as I call it, of Irish poetry, it was all about meter. It was all about the, the rhyme, the, the, the syllables. Um, we call it syllabic poetry. And the fact, I suppose, that it was, the, 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 the fact that the poets had to spend six, seven, eight years in school learning this type of poetry probably tells you how much, how structured the meter was, how structured the rhyme was, how structured the, um, the syllabic nature of it was. And it always strikes me um, uh, uh, that the extent that they went to, the, the, the poetry uh, they wrote about, a lot of times they were about love and their love for a woman, but it wasn't real love because obviously they had to write about it. It, it was, they were given a, a title, but it was more about the the structure of the poetry, the, the, the number of syllables, the number of how the rhyme happened. But at the same time, it, it became beautiful poetry. Now, the, the woman didn't exist because you know, it was probably an exercise that they were given as part of their training or um, as part of a competition or to kind of in competition with, with, with other poets. But it's amazing the fact that even with all that structure, all that internal or that regulated poetry, that the, that the, the type of poetry that, that they wrote, it's amazing. So yeah, at the time, I suppose meter um, and rhyme was really important and the syllabic nature that there had to be a certain number of syllables, certain number of vowels in one part of the, in one half of the line that had to match up the second half of the line. Um, so that was really important at the time. Not so in contemporary poetry. I think it's probably more like um, the, the contemporary poetry in any part of the world, you know, where we have, I suppose we deal with contemporary themes, political th themes, all sorts of themes. Um, and where I suppose rules um, aren't as important as they, as they once were. It's also maybe important to note about that, I suppose, that tra poet, poet, poetic tradition in Ireland probably stems from two traditions, the English language tradition and the Irish language tradition. Um, and it's always kind of, it saddens me to a degree, we often about Irish studies, you know, and when we talk about Irish studies, 
the majority of poets in Irish studies are English language poets. And, and that's really important because they're really, really good poets. But we tend to forget about the Irish language poets and uh, what, they can, what they can bring to the table. Because even though they bring some of the same themes and some of the same types of poems, it's often, it's often, it's always maybe expressed differently in the Irish language. So while, while um, I, the, the example I gave earlier on about the Isle of Water, my mother's burial, it was emotive in the English language, but it was also really emotive in the Irish language and it was expressed in a different way. So I suppose to, to answer your question, yeah, it, um, I suppose the tradition of having really structured metered poetry um, is, is not, um, it's, it's not as obvious today in that at that particular time, that's where the focus was. I think the focus today now is not really translating or to write words as such, it's to write emotions. Well, where in the earlier poetry, it was about, not about the emotion, but about how you, how you write it. Now it's the, the opposite. It's how we can convey that emotion. So like I say that um, poetry for me isn't about reading it or about the words. It, it's the feelings that it can create inside of us, if, if that makes sense. Well, it, it really makes sense. And it just, just a, a quick follow on question. Um, now that I have some more information, um, during the part during the patronage period, um, you know, just speaking uh, loosely, um, were they just trying to impress each other? I mean, or were the common? Uh, was there a common audience, or was it, I suppose, a courtly audience, or was it only the local king, or you know, who were they? Uh, who were they writing for? Because the it just seems like the you know quote unquote common people, if they had a, a possibility of having an ear on that poetry, uh, would they have understood the rules? Yeah, it, it's a bit of both. Um, as in the first part of your question, were they, were they competition with themselves or were, with the local kings? It was really, I suppose, a bit of both, because what would happen is they would, if they were working for a leader, or what we call a Taoiseach, and the, the word that we have now for our prime minister, Taoiseach, is what came, originally came from a leader, a, a tribe leader. Um, so working for him you know they had to be at their top of their game because he was paying them you know giving them food lodgings money to, to write for them but at the same time a lot of them would have had an eye out for the more the richer leaders so while they were writing poetry for one leader it had to be they were in competition with other writers because they were all kind of fighting for to get the better jobs a bit like today i suppose when you're big, it's, in, in the states it's tenured and, and non-tenured you know it's kind of we're fighting for we're always fighting to get that step ahead or to get that step better. So I think at the time, yeah, it was a bit of that. Um, it's a good question about the common people, the normal people. I wonder, I often wonder, did they have much of an interest in the poetry or was it just for, um, for the elite? And I think maybe it was. If you think maybe about in our own society today and those people maybe who go, for, uh, who go to college, university for seven or eight years, you know, I th I'm thinking of maybe like doctors and lawyers. That's maybe a section of society in itself as regards the learning that, that they do. And those who don't engage with that learning don't really bother with it, if that makes sense. So I think maybe the same might have been true at that time, that they left the poetry and the writing and, and the words to the professors and the poets, and they got on with the farming. Maybe I'm wrong, but that would be my understanding of it. Well, just, uh, and finally, was the satire, I know that satire was an important thing, uh, during the patronage period, uh, during the Gaelic period, uh, would that have been in poetry and in meter, or would that have been in sort of prose? Or yeah, I don't I know. It, yeah, some of it probably would have been in meter if they were. I, I would guess if they were writing, if it was part of their job. So if one of the leaders wanted them to write a satire against another leader, um, it would have to be in, in the um, in in the meter. But I, I would guess, and again, I'm not fully aware of this, but if they were sacked. Or if they were given the door by their leader, they were, they might write a satire that probably didn't follow any rules. Thank you, Seamus. Thank you very much. So my question, my first question, will be perhaps a little bit more forceful um, <laughs> than that from Dr. Kearney. I am, as you know, by training a, a linguist, and as fascinated as I am by the poetry, I am going to hold you to the fire here. And so <laughs> Ethnologue estimates that approximately 1.2 million speakers of the Irish language exist, right? They're, they're alive. And you had mentioned some figures earlier for us, um, speculating that somewhere between the 4.2% who use it daily and the 40% who claim to speak it is probably somewhere closer to the truth. And so despite all that, it's considered at least by ethnologue to be a threatened language. And so I'm wondering, just personally and professionally, 
what role do you see the Irish language playing today beyond simply a symbolic one? That is where people might know some words and some phrases, or they might actually have some Irish ancestry and feel that that is something connecting them to it, but they don't actually have any functional fluency in the language. And what steps are being taken to encourage its use in a variety of sociolinguistic domains? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because I think that maybe from the outside, and even on the inside, we often use the Irish language in a symbolic sense. So maybe a session of our parliament might be started or ended by an Irish prayer. We still we, we start our parliament session with a prayer. I think it's in Irish. Um, and when we have official functions um, where there's a prime minister or one of our ministers speaking, it's often started or ended in the Irish language. Um, when Queen Elizabeth visited um, Ireland, um, I think President Obama was president because he visited the same week. So it was a good few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, she started her speech in, in, in Irish, she said, so which means Madam President and friends, which was a big thing at the time because having an English queen speaking in Irish, but what I'm, what I'm getting at it was, was seen as symbolic, but really behind all of that, and if you kind of dig deeper into the issues or into the Irish society, it, it's, it's, it's a lot less symbolic and more real, if I can put it that way. So for example, um, I mentioned our constitution there about the you know the Irish the Irish language is the first language of, of, of the country. So already I suppose there's kind of that attachment, that identity, that belonging, that it's it's it's, it's our language. And that's not just symbolic, because at the moment we're um there's what we have uh, one of one of our acts of parliament, if like is the official languages act. Um that act states that you know all public bodies to a degree have to be bilingual. So as an Irish language speaker, if I want to speak to my local authority or if I want to get my uh, television license or if I want to get uh, my driver's license or whatever I, I want to do that involves a public body, is my right to speak to that body in Irish or to correspond to them in Irish and to get correspondence back, to receive correspondence back in the Irish language. So that's a, that's a very big thing. Um, so, you know, that, so what that means that at least with government bodies, an Irish par person can, can have all their interactions through Irish. What's also important um, and what's becoming increasingly important, I suppose, and increasingly popular is Irish language medium education. So what we have, Gwail Scalina and Gwail Colosti. So many parents are now sending their children to Irish language medium schools. So you can receive all your education through the medium of Irish, um, your primary education, your, your preschooling, your, um, your preschool, your primary education, your secondary education, through the medium of Irish. So the only time you would speak English would be if you're doing an English language class. And the growth of those, those schools, they're growing really, really popular. You know, so lots and lots of, of, of um, children are attending those schools. Um, what's also important to mention, you know, if you talk about education and you talk about those public bodies, the other side of that was the social element. You know, you have Irish language media. And there's been, to an extent, a growth in Irish language media. Unfortunately, as regards newspapers, um, that has declined. We have, we've had two or three Irish language newspapers that have ceased functioning in the past number of years. But I think that's maybe a, a trend that's happening maybe across the globe in newspaper um, sales. But we have an Irish language television, television station. We have Irish language radio stations, which really, really cater for younger audiences, which is quite interesting as well. So, so what I'm trying to say is that the symbolic is what we see maybe from the outside. But what's happening on the ground is that there are lots, there's lots and lots of interaction with the language on a daily basis. That's why I'm saying that we've got to be careful with that 40% who say they speak Irish and uh, overall, and then the 4% who speak on a daily basis, because you're going from two extremes. You're going from, like if you fill out the census and the question is, do you speak Irish? You know, I would take yes. But if I go to my local shop, I'd be speaking English. So you think, um, is it on a daily basis or a weekly basis? But if you dig down into the figures, I would think that, it's, it's a lot more positive than that 4% might suggest, and maybe not as optimistic as that 40 or 45% might suggest. That's excellent. If I could just follow up uh, with another, let's say on the ground question, since you had mentioned that. I'm wondering yeah. maybe if you could describe the role of language attitudes and or perceptual dialectology as it concerns the use of Irish in Ireland. And so in particular, how do non-native speakers perceive the use or presence of Irish in everyday life? And how do native speakers perceive the dialectal variation that is 
invariably present among speakers, both in the Irish diaspora and in the Gueltacht. Yeah, well, I suppose dialectically, um, it, it would have been more pronounced maybe in previous generations when travel um, wasn't as co common or as, as popular as regards you know, traveling between all over Ireland. Um, at the moment, but now, you know, a speaker of one dialect will readily understand this, a speaker in another dialect. So there's, um, as regards perceptions of that, you know, that's, you could speak, to, you, I could speak to, like I would speak in Munster Irish, and I could speak to a person with Connacht Irish in a full conversation and know exactly what they're saying, but we just speak maybe with different accents and maybe pronounce words that bit differently. Uh, there, there is no, um, the, that would be the only difference as such. Okay, so it's really, really important to mention that, but it's also important to mention what is kind of a unifier, to use that expression, is the education system. And that what we have in the education system is a standardized version of the Irish language that incorporates many of the dialects. So by going to school, in a way, it's maybe like a fourth dialect, you're, you're speaking, you're learning to speak a standardized Irish, but you're also, particularly at leaving certain levels, so it's like our, at the end of our high school, um, you have an examination where you are tested, you're, you have a listening comprehension on all the dialects. So while you're learning, I suppose, in the standardized version of the language, you're also encouraged to learn and to pick up and to be able to understand other dialects. Um, it's interesting you also mentioned, about, I suppose, the perceptions of the Irish language among, among non-native speakers. For a very long time, um, which is I find this interesting, speaking about where we spoke, speak about what we spoke about earlier on and where the Irish language came from, I mean, part of the poverty of poor people. For a long time, maybe in the early 90s, it would have been seen maybe as maybe the, a language of the elite, which is nearly, um, it is kind of a, a turning of the tables. And maybe not to, to a complete ex, to that complete extent, but the fact that um, if you were able to send your children to an all Irish speaking school, for example, and if you were able to, um, if you live in that an area, I suppose that you know, there are lots of competition for schools and for school places and for um, and where you live, and maybe certain towns would have set up an Irish language speaking school. So for a long time, if you were seen to be able to go to one of these schools, um, not that you were elite, but at least you were you were different. You were set apart. You had a, you were able to converse in a different language. Not so much the case nowadays because there those the number of schools has increased. But it's interesting maybe how, how times change and how, how perceptions change. Um, but overall, and I can't quote any particular surveys on this, um, but there have been lots of surveys done where, you know, the Irish people have a very, very strong attachment to the Irish language. And there have been debates about guess, taking it away from the education system, not making it compulsory um, and so on. But it has never come to any, um, any result of that it has happened because it's always been uh, seen as part of us, part of the education system and, and something that people want to do. In fact, lots of surveys and anecdotal evidence suggests that many people later in life regret that they're not, they're unable to speak it, they're unable to converse in it, they're unable to, that they should have learned it when they did. Um, and just maybe finally, I know kind of um, going down a rabbit hole here, but when the, with the emergence of the free state, 1921, 1922, um, unfortunately, I, I say unfortunately, that the, the job of the of preserving the Irish language. So where what I might have mentioned in my talk to the Gaelic League, which were which was a, a, an entity for preserving the Irish language and for promoting it, that job with the with the free state, with, when we had our own government, was given to the Department of Education. So the Department of Education was seen as the, the preservers, the, the keepers of the Irish language. And to a degree that that didn't work out because what you had um, was, and there've been lots of research done on this, where you have Irish language becoming a compulsory school subject. So instead of being something that people could choose and want to do, it became something that people had to do. And that people were and people were seeing that they were forced to do it. Um, and you have situations maybe a time when corporal punishment was in Ireland that you know, if you didn't, if you couldn't speak Irish, you could pronounce, as you mentioned dialects there, if you could, if your pronunciation wasn't wasn't great, or if you couldn't speak Irish, or if you didn't have your homework done in Irish, you were given uh, a beating or giving a belt um, at, at that particular time. So yeah, so I suppose what I'm saying is it has, you mentioned at the start with the multifaceted past, it, it, that is their perceptions have changed, but luckily at this particular time, the perception of Irish language is really, really positive. All right, 
Here's an easy one. <laughs> um, okay, well, if, if one were to direct a student toward a, a novelist in Irish who is contemporary and relatively accessible, who might fit the bill? Yeah, I, I could say there are lots and lots, but I suppose one that I would like, one that I um, would suggest to you or if you have students who'd be interested, um, it's a guy called Ray O'Leish. So it's uh, L-A-I-G-H-L-E for the, the accent, I-S. And he's written many novels, uh, novels for teenagers, novels for learners, novels for adults, and often in contemporary, contemporary um, themes. Um, so like he's talked maybe written about people addicted to drugs and um, one of his more recent books which i i haven't read it but i can't wait to read it it's about um your, one of your former presidents donald trump and um the, the book is it's it's humorous i i gather it's humorous i haven't read it where uh, donald trump wants to build his his wall um but when the, the contractors that he gets are two irish guys who are living in new york or in boston so i haven't read the story but it's, it's that kind of um so it's that kind of contemporary humorous kind of um, maybe juxtaposition of, of the diaspora and politics and that kind of thing. So definitely check out Ray O'Leish, even, if, um, um, even if, if Donald Trump or American politics isn't your thing, I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy the, the, the language element of it. Thank you, that's perfect. And so my final question, um, I actually have a final question here that's perhaps a little bit more loaded. So I'm going to toss that out the window because I have one that came to me while you were presenting that I, I hope is perhaps a little bit more interesting. So my other two questions have been mostly about synchronic linguistics. And so I'm wondering now if we can shift to a diachronic standpoint. You had mentioned newspapers, you showed us some excerpts, you demonstrated some, some poetry for us at the very beginning. I'm wondering, especially given that the, the corpus of written Irish in the United States is so small, have there been any sort of, let's say, large scale corpus studies on that small set of Irish language data, perhaps to see um, how the, the variety of Irish spoken in the United States compared to or contrasted with that found in, in, in Ireland itself? Not particular, not that I'm aware of, but I know there's um, there's a scholar. Uh, he's passed on now, uh, Professor Kenneth Nielsen, who did a lot of work on the Irish language um, in the states. Particularly, he would have looked at, uh, as would have a, a, a Professor William Mahan from Aberystwyth University, would have looked at um, Irish speakers from particular areas in Ireland and particular Gwaeltoft areas. Um, so I suppose looking at where they were from, but as regards um, a corpus of the words or of the maybe the dialect or how that the language was spoken. I don't think that has been done, and that would be something that would be really interesting to do. And I think it's something that, that needs to be done. And um, what what I would guess would be, or what I would suggest, or maybe think, a lot of the speakers, some of the speakers who went to America, or some of the speakers, sorry, who spoke Irish in America, would have been learners themselves. So what you would have found, what you would have found, um, in some of the writings in the newspapers and the poetry uh, was it, it wasn't really, it would have been an exact representation of the Irish language. There would often be mistakes, there would often have been, um, you would know, and I, this again comes back to maybe um, social linguistics and so on, that they were a learner of Irish as opposed to a native speaker of Irish. Um, so it would be interesting, but I suppose what you would need to look at first would be where they came from, what part of Ireland, um, where, how they spoke Irish or where they spoke Irish in America. What I mean by that is, you know, if they emigrated from, from Kerry, for example, they would have ended up, a lot of them would have ended up in Boston, New York. And then if that was the case, were they first generation speakers? Did they learn it from their parents? Or were, did they learn it from some of those societies that we mentioned? So there's probably a lot of background work to be done, but it, it really would be an, inter an interesting, interesting topic because as I'm talking now, it would be interesting too to see for example, um, you talk about dialects, you would have maybe Irish speakers who would have, from maybe Kerry, might have married an Irish speaker from Galway or Donegal. Because when they got to America, I suppose those boundaries, the local county boundaries that we have in Ireland, wouldn't have been an issue. Everybody was Irish. So then, interesting, what type of Irish they spoke amongst themselves and what type of Irish did they, did they teach to their, their children? Speaking of that, a lot of times, 
we notice from the, the records that they would have, um, religion would have been really important that that was done through the meaning of Irish language. So if they had their jobs and at home, they might have spoken in English, but that they would have requested, we've seen letters where they've requested from Ireland that they send out an Irish speaking priest so that they can hear confessions and that their the last rites and their prayers can be heard through, through Irish. But to answer your initial question, I'm not sure if that has been done, but it would really be something interesting something that, that should be undertaken. Well, I was scheduled for a third question. I don't know, uh, should, should, uh, should we do one more? Yeah, go for it. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, when a critic judges the literary quality of a contemporary novel or short story in Irish, is it measured against a literary tradition in that language, or is it rather more measured against modern trends uh, found perhaps in other European literatures, such as French or English? Uh, what makes a great Irish novel today? Yeah, I, I, I think that question is really interesting, and it reminds me, I mentioned the revival period, and um, I'm sure maybe you've heard of Patrick Pierce, Patrick Pierce. Patrick Pierce was an Irish revolutionary, and uh, he died following the 1916 Rising. He was executed, but he had very interesting, um, maybe before before his time, opinions on Irish literature and Irish, on the Irish language. So at that particular time, which is about early 1900s, uh, there were two maybe schools of thought with Irish literature. One was that it should focus on Ireland, on Irish-related themes. And on the dialects that we that we mentioned there, that it should be written, um, it should be Irish should be written as it was spoken, you know that it, that it should reflect society. Patrick Pierce, while he kind of agreed with that, one of his other really important um, opinions, which probably isn't really we wouldn't consider it important, say we consider it a foregone conclusion today, was that if literature is to be um, good, if it's to be important. If it's to be judged as being good or important, it has to reflect themes, it has to reflect styles that are happening in, in the international literary community. So, for example, he, talk, he talked about I, the short stories at the time that he, that he was interested in should be like, should use the themes and structures and styles of the Russian short story, the French short story, and that kind of thing. So, even at the beginning of the revival of Irish literature, that was a big question. You know, how was it going to be judged? Who should judge it? What was a good novel? What was a good play? What was a good uh, short story? And they kind of they kind of start with short stories because I suppose they were easier. It was it was probably easier to write a, a three or four pages of a short story than a novel. So at the time, that was a big big argument. Present day contemporary, I would think they're probably judged in two ways. One is I suppose amongst the um, the anthology that is Irish literature at the moment, Irish language literature. And you know how is it? How does it reflect? Where does it stand in that body of Irish language literature? So again, it might talk about the style of the Irish language, the, the dialect that's used, how is it written, and, and that kind of thing. But more often than not, you know, it is compared. It, is, it does stand like an, an English novel or a French novel on the world stage as as having those themes or having that structure and um, having that, I suppose, um, the style of writing. So it's quite judged two ways. Judged. In, as any other body of literature would be or any part of literature would be. But there's also, I think we go back to our own kind of um, uh, that 1916, 1917, 1920s style where it's still kind of judged against the other Irish writing. How good is the Irish language? Is it, again, to use that expression, is it book Irish or Irish that's learnt? Or is it like a native speaker level? That, that kind of thing. Uh, but definitely um, the standard of Irish writing today, it would be judged uh, as any uh, piece of writing will be, be that in French, English, Irish, Spanish. Thank you. Yeah. And so with that, I think we are pretty close to our time here. So just for my part, and then I'll, I'll let Dr. Kearney speak, but I just want to take a quick minute here to say thank you for your time, for sharing your knowledge with us, and for, quite frankly, one of the most fascinating presentations I have seen in quite some time. Thank you very much. That's it's been really, really, it's really nice of you. And I'd like to thank yourself, Troy and Chris. It's been really interesting. I, I really like to get the, the invitation. And I know you're doing great things over there. And I hope to be part of that in, in some ways as, as we go forward. But thank you very much to both of you. And I also echo that. Uh, let this be uh, 
as uh, as Humphrey Bogart said, uh, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Great stuff. Thank you very much. As he would say in, or in Irish, Gurv Mahagut. Thank you. Slang of oil. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.